you. Uh, welcome everybody. This is the National and Cultural Resources um, Committee for the East Bay Regional Park District. And we are meeting on Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. And uh, this is a meeting which is completely virtual. I don't know if that means anybody's at the Peralta Oaks uh, boardroom or you're all at your desk, but welcome. So um, I'm gonna ask um, Tamara to do a roll call. First of the um, board members who are here and then uh, oh, at least a couple of the um, staff members who will be leading us off. Okay. Committee Chair Lane. Here. Director Coffey. Here. Director Corbett. Here. Chief of Stewardship, Matt Crowell. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Assistant General Manager of Acquisition, Stewardship and Development, Christina Kelchner. Here. Christopher okay. Solutz. Well, and then I think we'll introduce people as, as they present uh, okay. from there. Okay. <clears throat> so today's meeting is held virtually pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. Board members and staff may participate via phone and video conferencing. We are also providing live audio and video streaming and have provided the public the opportunity to email or call in prior to the meeting for public comment. All information regarding participation in this meeting can be found on the agenda on the district website, which is ebparks.org. And we will be taking public comments after each presentation. So do any of the committee members have any questions about the meeting procedures? All right, not seeing any. So let's turn to the agenda. And our first item is an update on the Ohlone curriculum, uh, which will be presented by Supervising Naturalist for Coyote Hills, Christopher uh, Suditz. Is that how you pronounce it? Sulats. Thank you so much, Director Lane. Sudots. And okay, and then I wanna show you what I have on my shelf. Excellent. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Which is this binder. And at one point I read it, but um, that was a few years ago. <laughs> so please proceed. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, committee members and members of the public and East Bay Regional Park District staff. Uh, my name is Christopher Sulat. I'm the supervising naturalist at Coyote Hills Regional Park. And I've been in this role a little over a year. I previously worked as an educator and a park ranger and naturalist and volunteer manager in a variety of habitats and institutions throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. I actually began my career uh, in environmental education as an interpreter student aide at Coyote Hills uh, in 2005. So I have a very big affinity for Coyote Hills uh, and everything that takes place there. I also have the esteemed pleasure of working with naturalist Mayor Ron Yesterwis. Uh, who uh, will be the only full-time naturalist at Coyote Hills after our longtime colleague will be retiring at the end of the month. So I'll let uh, Mayron say a little bit more about herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Mayron Yeshuas. I'm a naturalist at Coyote Hills Regional Park. Yesterday marked my one-year anniversary with the district. I've been working in interpretation and environmental ed education in various institutions throughout California. I'm excited to continue that work here within the Park District and thank you all for the opportunity to share more about the programming that we're doing today. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. I'm going to share our presentation. Let's see, should be up. All right, so today we're gonna to be sharing about the work that we've done with the Ohlone Educational Program and how in our ongoing relationship with local native peoples, we're ensuring that all of our educational content is indigenous centered. Every year at Coyote Hills, we educate over 5,000 school students, uh, both virtually and in person, and thousands of visitors about indigenous people of the Bay Area. And these educational programs have a really long history at Coyote Hills. We are so appreciative of the countless numbers of people who have shaped these programs over the years 
And this includes, but isn't limited to Dr. Beverly Ortiz and the Ohlone curriculum, uh, which you showed earlier, Director Lane. Um, and there are so many others who laid a amazing foundation, which really helped us to be able to move these programs forward. So Mayron and I were part of diversity, equity, and inclusion training that took place uh, in our interpretation and recreation department in 2021. And I believe they were taking place before then. And coming out of that training, we decided that we wanted to embark on a new approach, which was updating our educational programs to incorporate historically accurate, holistic and inclusive language, imagery and resources. And we really wanted to center indigenous voices in the stories that we tell about indigenous people. And so we expanded upon this idea to include updates of our language in both our school programs and our public programs that, include clarif that included clarifying our messages, our imagery, our accuracy, and our relevance of our programs, as well as centering Indigenous people in the programming that we did and adding first-person uh, stories and narratives. We wanted to acknowledge and recognize truth in history, and we wanted to make sure that we were uh, doing everything we could to improve these programs, which included evaluating them both internally and externally. Uh, and the most important thing was fostering ongoing relationships that we have with the Indigenous people throughout the Bay Area. So working in partnership with communities, we've really continued to add these first person narratives and contemporary Indigenous photos, videos, projects, and skills to all of our educational programs. And in our relationships, there has been, and there continues to be a very strong emphasis on recognizing and compensating for the labor that many Indigenous people provide to East Bay Regional Park District staff and to visitors. This labor can take many forms. It can be their time, it can be their skill set, it can be their knowledge base, uh, it can just be their willingness to share. And we want to make sure that they're adequately compensated for that. And so, in the messaging that our program, in our programming, we've ensured that we share these core messages that Indigenous people are the first people of these lands and they've been here since time immemorial. Um, that's essentially the beginning of time. Um, that Indigenous people are still here today. That is very relevant and very necessary to explain. Um, and that they also have a sophisticated knowledge system, not only of natural resources, but of the interaction of plants and animals in the environment and throughout our parks and East Bay Regional Park District. And we want to honor and celebrate uh, all of their generosity, all of their sharing, and everything that they've been able to provide from their families, their histories, their traditions, and their cultures. And I'm going to hand it over to Mayron, who's going to talk about some more specifics of what we've updated. Yeah, thank you. And those messages that Chris mentioned really guided us on how we wanted to move forward with our programming. The first thing that we really wanted to address was the language and terminology that we were using in all of our programming. And especially when you're educating about people and culture, we wanted to make sure that we were as specific in our terminology and language as possible to honor and respect the diversity that exists within indigenous communities. And we also clarified terminology to better understand those connections between people and place. So it's important for us in the beginning of all of our programming to mention that Coyote Hills Regional Park is on the ancestral lands of Ohlone peoples and that there are several languages that are spoken by Ohlone peoples. For the area that we are in, Chichenyo is the language that is spoken and that there are village sites of the Tui Boon tribe. We impart on people in our programming that people's preferences on how they identify can vary and change over time. And that if you are talking about or working with an indigenous individual to ask about their preferences. We incorporated more of the Chichenyo language in our programming and we have students speak that language because language can be a really important part of culture. You can see uh, in this image over here that in, on our visitor center, we have a banner and that is a sentence in Chechenyo and we have the students speak this. It says, Akoit Mayan Shatoshikma, which means welcome to Coyote Hills. Another crucial change as we were moving forward in our programming was to make sure that we were using the present tense to really bring forth the message that Ohlone people are still here today and that people are interconnected with their environments. And talking about this relationship as active is not only more accurate, but it also gives credit to the skillful land management techniques and knowledge systems that enabled Ohlone people to thrive. And you can see some more examples of those changes in languages, uh, language that we used. 
Right, next. It was also really important for us in our programming to acknowledge truth and history and make sure that truth was discussed in our programs. So on the screen, you can see the National Association for Interpretation award-winning publication that was created by our district staff. And this discusses how the Spanish missionization period affected indigenous people and how those effects are ongoing and forever change the landscape. It was important for us to acknowledge this period in history and also bring forth in our programming that this time in history is not the defining narrative. It's not the beginning or the end of the story of indigenous people and that indigenous people are still here today and their culture is still being practiced and passed on through generations. Next. Another update to our programming was to make sure that we had a diversity of imagery that reflected the diversity within indigenous communities and really add images of indigenous youth to increase relevancy, relatability, and increase our ability to question stereotypes. Next. Chris was mentioning a really big shift in our programming was to make sure that we were having indigenous centered content. And we had been focusing on messaging that indigenous people are still here today and really encouraging folks when they're learning about indigenous people to make sure that they're including indigenous voices. There is a lot of great resources that are within the park district that guests and students have access to, but we wanted to add to that an opportunity for students and visitors to hear directly from indigenous people tell their own stories and their own narrative, which there is no substitute for. Every year in October for 25 years, Coyote Hills Regional Park has hosted a gathering of Ohlone peoples. And this event brought together Ohlone people to share about their culture with guests through presentations and activities. Uh, with safety concerns, we weren't able to do an in-person gathering last year and the community was in support of that but we wanted to use that as an opportunity to have a virtual event where we can center indigenous people. And that's what we did. We worked with Ruth Orta, who is a Himren, Halqueen, Saklan, Aloni, Bamiwak elder, who's been working with the park district for 26 years to have four presentations spanning four generations of an Aloni family sharing about their history, traditions, and culture. And the name of the event that we created came from a quote from Ruth Orta. Ruth often shares about her mother and she was sharing about how her mother knew how to grow her own food. And she was telling us that her mother used to say if anything was to happen to her or to happen in the world, that they know how to put seeds in the ground really speaking to those skills and lessons taught to her by her mother. And this phrase also encompassed indigenous people's sophisticated knowledge systems, respect and connection to the land as the first peoples of this land having always been here and who are still here today. So we spent a lovely Sunday together and we were able to film these presentations Ruth often speaks about increasing people's knowledge of indigenous people and saying for people to know about us and to know that we're still here, we have to go out and tell them. And that's what she spent so many years doing. So for these presentations, Ruth presented on acorn processing. Her daughter, Ramona Garibay, who is in the bottom right, presented on the soap plant and how to make soap root brushes. Her daughter, Sabrina Garibay, who is in the center, presented on the plant dog bane and how to make cordage string. We also had abalone and pine nut bead necklace making presentations by Mariah Caldrone, who is the great granddaughter of Ruth Orta, along with uh, Freddie Caldrone and Brenda Morris, who are pictured here. So what we did was that we created a webinar on Zoom and we recorded a Facebook event that is still posted on our page. We had a lot of interest for this live event and this continues to be viewed and shared with others. We had uh, a total reach of this content of over 30,000 people. 
From this data, we saw how high performing, reaching and engaging this content was. And this video and advertisement around it became some of the most engaged with content that we had. This video from these presentations and from this event continues to play in our visitor center. And uh, you can see some comments here from people that attended the live viewing of this. A lot of them were saying that they were really appreciative of the knowledge that was shared, some of the connections to things that they had learned and heard before, and how they were continue to share it with people within their own communities. And we had a lot of teachers attending saying that they were going to share this information with their students also. As we continue to add Indigenous-centered content to our programmings, we also compiled a resource list of videos and articles on the work that Indigenous peoples are doing throughout the Bay Area. And this resource list was shared with school teachers after every field trip that was completed. It's available to the public on our website, and it includes topics like the Chichenya language, caring for the land, the use of fire, Ohlone foods, and a lot more educational information. Another one of our goals as we were moving forward with our programming was to increase the accessibility of this resource page we shared, uh, with, that we shared within our school programs. Um, so we created a QR code for the resource page. And for any of you that want to hold your phone up to that QR code, you can actually get that resource list right now. And again, this is all uh, located on our website. And those resources have been with, used by other departments within the district um, and kind of all over. So with all of those changes and updates um, and additional content that we added to our programming, we wanted to see how that was being re received by teachers and their students. So we created a short survey to send to teachers after each program that they attended. And we were asking teachers about the relevancy of the program, if it met their needs, which part resonated with students the most, and of course, if there were any changes that we could make. We received a lot of positive feedback and favorable scores from the program. We had scales of one to five, five being the most favorable, and we had an average score of 4.94. And this was encouraging. And through that survey, we were also able to gain some insight um, from teachers about the program. And that was really helpful as we continue to work and grow on this program and move forward in the future also. And of course, some of the best feedback you can get are directly from the students. So here are some letters that we received from students. And in these letters, it was really encouraging to see them reflect back some of the natural resources that we were specifically talking about and the traditional uses by Ohlone peoples. And again, really highlighting those knowledge systems. Um, and there's some fun drawings of me in these letters too, uh, for kicks. Um, and uh, again, that really reflected back to the main messages um, and the goals that we had for this programming. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to talk more about our ongoing partnerships. Thank you, Mayron. So we've continued the uh, contractor program that compensates local indigenous people for their time, knowledge, and expertise. Uh, this is based on the Ohlone intern program that was started in the 1990s. And again, this through this work, we've sought to meet the requests that are asked of us. Um, we wanna build relationships. And similarly to the work that we did with Ruth Orta, we've connected with Theodore Mike Benias, who's shown here, and his son, as well as his grandson, to open up opportunities for them to educate and provide interpretation to our visitors, uh, as well as his family. Mike and I have talked a lot, uh, and he's mentioned that he feels that one of the most important things that he can pass on to his children and his grandchildren is his knowledge of his culture. And it's through these opportunities that he's had with Coyote Hills Regional Park and the park district that he feels like he's been able to learn and share more than he ever could imagine possible. Um, so we feel really, really grateful and appreciative of that. We've also been able to meet several of the requests of the Confederated Villages of the Lashon uh, and the Sabora Trade Land Trust, which included acorn gathering uh, for traditional acorn processing, as well as collecting willows for basket making. Uh, we worked with stewardship and park operations on these projects to make sure that we we're following the best practices and not affecting any sensitive species. 
And we're really hoping that we can continue to do more of these and honor these requests in the future. Uh, the lack of access to traditional ceremonial grounds as well as land uh, that's appropriate for multiple day ceremonies or even gathering is a really serious challenge that's still faced by Ohlone people today, um, since all of these tribes are not federally recognized. We've also begun partnering with uh, the Muwekma tribe on more Chicheno language translation projects, uh, which I'll talk about in just a minute here. So moving forward, we're gonna continue to update our educational content um, by continuing to include indigenous communities in everything that we do by listening to and honoring the requests of indigenous people, uh, ensuring that a diversity of indigenous perspectives are representative and striving for consistency across the district on programming about indigenous people. We're specifically at Coyote Hills planning to update our visual content with more indigenous perspectives. This includes uh, an augmented reality, uh, part of the Explore app. We're working with Kevin Damstra, supervising naturalist at Big Break, uh, or sorry, at Black Diamond uh, Mind uh, on more digital content components. Um, and we're also going to be installing uh, signposts for trail names at Coyote Hills Regional Park that have been translated into the Chichenyo language. So we're really excited about that. We're gonna also continue working with indigenous communities to create more programming opportunities, um, as well as some reproduction structures. We have a Thule house called a Rue in front of our visitor center, and we'd like to provide more of those um, throughout the park as well. And we'd like to reimagine and kind of re-envision what the annual Ohlone gathering looks like. Uh, for all of us, COVID has had a tremendous impact, um, but it's been especially hard on indigenous communities. So we wanna make sure that we can offer ways to gather safely as well as still carry on this long-standing event. As we continue to take all these steps forward towards a more equitable interpretive future and by practicing fairness and equity in our tre treatment of the communities we engage with, we really also hope that we can showcase the importance of seeing ourselves as part of these communities and as caretakers of each other and of the environment. I feel that in our roles as educators, we have a responsibility to, uh, to take a really distinct view and assessment of what we teach and how we interact with our communities. We gotta listen, we've gotta provide resources, prioritize building relationships that are honest, inclusive, and equitable. And all of this, I feel like starts with centering indigenous voices and building more equitable partnerships. Thank you so much for your time today, and we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, I see Director Corbett's hand raised, but yeah. I don't know that I can un unmute you. <laughs> uh, okay, so you, uh, you have some comments or questions, uh, Ellen? I don't have a question, but I do have comments. Um, thank you very much uh, for presenting um, these wonderful events that do happen there. I know they've been slowed a little bit because of the situation around us, but um, you know, I've been to many of those. It's, it's uh, something I used to go to even before I was on the board. So it's uh, just a really wonderful place for the community to come together and learn so much about um, the history of this area and respect it and learn from it. So uh, thank you for that. And also of course, respecting the wonderful people who come to share the history and the story. And uh, you know, I, uh, I also have one of those lovely necklaces with the little um, shell. <laughs> and that's just really a wonderful thing to have and to watch people put those together. So thank you. It's it's really a, a wonder, one of the most wonderful programs. We have lots of wonderful programs, but one of the most wonderful things we do in um, the park district. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, so Colin, you have a comment or question? Uh, yeah, a number. I'm, I just found the uh, Native People's Resource PDF from Coyote Hills website. <laughs> I was going to ask how to find it, but I just did. <clears throat> and that's going to be very helpful. That's wonderful. So yeah. We... What, let me, the, the question is, are you, when you speak of updating, and we saw a couple of slides where the updating focus is going, are you talking about the curriculum that Bevertiz published uh, that Director Lane has on her shelf? Is, I have the uh, 
I have an electronic version of it. Is that being updated? So we haven't made any updates to the Ohlone curriculum. Um, as you know, it's, I, I mean, it's, it, that's a very hard document to update because it's, it's amazing. It's fantastic. And it's such a phenomenal resource. What we've been updating is our educational programs um, and trying to make sure that, that the content that we're presenting to school students and to the public um, has updates and changes that are relevant to the communities that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. um, but that curriculum, uh, it's, it's a fantastic tome that we, we haven't made any changes to. Uh, to. Don't feel that it's necessary. It's so it would continue to be shared with uh, educators and uh, geared toward, I'm reading the third grade, uh, third grade uh, level. Absolutely. So that's still in a list of resources that we also share with uh, with all of our teachers. And it's also on our website as part of our East Bay Regional Park District resources. Um, so that is still still something that we're constantly sharing with with teachers, educators and the public. Yeah. The um, publication that I use a lot, you had on one of your slides, uh, was the one Bev did uh, several years ago, designed for educators. It's that pamphlet that pulled out with a map of the languages and the history. Um, and uh, my memory is that proved so popular that we quickly ran out of them. Uh, I don't know what the status is now, but I've uh, used, I, I framed one of those and I could probably show it, um, but, um, my wife and I put it in a large frame and we take it on ambassador uh, tabling events that we do. And it's very, very popular. The, the map is the one which shows the various tribal names uh, and, and uh, people who you know, really enjoy going uh, up to it and, and reading it. And I think we have a couple of the panels in the frame too. And we were able to put it up on the, on the, uh, whatever the table is that we're working on as uh, as ambassadors. So that has proven very valuable uh, to me as a spokesperson for the district when, when I'm out tabling uh, and, and including that piece of our history in what, you know, along with all our park pamphlets, right? It's, uh, it's, it's popular. So I'm wondering, is that in need of, of updating? Uh, probably need in more more printing of that one. It is still available in print in our visitor center. Um, and we've also have, we have it up in, in our visitor center and we give it away for, to, to visitors. Um, and it's also available, available digitally on our website. Um, but yes, that is a phenomenal resource. I can't tell you how many teachers um, have, have talked to me about that and how they put it up in their classrooms or they're constantly sharing it. Um, and visitors as well are, are absolutely impressed by it. We feel so fortunate that um, that, that was put together. And so, yeah, we could probably stand to do a few more printings of that, though. What's the best resource? I'm, I'm getting real personal in terms of my own experiences doing tabling and such. Uh, what is the best resource for me to actually learn about the various layers of, of names the Native groups are using? Uh, you know, on, on, the, on the pamphlet, it defines... Uh -huh where the, the, the tribal units, I think they're called triblets or, you know, and they, and it also defines mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, in my focus being in Contra Costa, it defines where the, the tribe uh, was, in, so it was Ohlone or Bay Miwok. And on top of that, it, it uh, references languages. Um, but I don't see, for instance, the common reference I, 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 I get today when attending Native, present, Native American presentations, the reference, for instance, commonly to, uh, and I, I'm pronouncing it wrong, Muakma, group of Ohlone people. Right. So from that pamphlet and the various names attributed to the tribes, I don't see that name anywhere, though I hear it commonly referred to um, when, when there are Native American presentations. The other one was, I think you referenced briefly, I don't know if I see it here, Lishan, Lishan? Lishan, yeah, the Lishan. Confederated I Villages see, of Lishan, yeah. I see that grouping and that name commonly used, but I'm not exactly sure, I, you, you know, occasionally I go to those websites and maybe I could learn a little more. 
So the yeah. layering of past or at least historic names, language references, and then current groups, um, I, I'm, I'm as someone who's trying to learn this stuff, right? This, this history and modern application of it. Uh, it's hard for me to learn the, the, the many layers of these names. And so I'm wondering if you can refer me uh, to any, and just go to their websites. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a single resource that kind of overlays all of those things, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's, uh, without getting too deep into the history, part of it is the, the, the tribal names and tribes is, is, is a kind of basic term that's used. The, the tribal names have changed and the regions have changed um, because of the missionization period, because of uh, all different types of things that have taken place in history. And so where many of the tribes currently are or reside or consider uh, their regions doesn't quite link up with those historical maps that we have. Um, and so I usually traditionally refer to the tribes themselves and their websites. They all have an active internet presence. Um, but it is really confusing. We, uh, we, we obviously struggle with trying to explain it to school children as well. Um, there's just so many different names um, and how do those overlap and overlay with each other? Yeah, um, it would be wonderful. It's a great idea to work on something that actually showcases all of these different things. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Okay, my last coffee. Oh. Yes, Mike. I'm sorry, if I just may jump in real quick. I think that the point you just made really speaks to the fact that um, this is a living, changing bunch of cultures. That information that we may have put out even just several years ago, um, we serve, it serves as a foundation. So the Ohlone curriculum is a fantastic foundation that we haven't found any reasons to put any changes into because we're building upon that. But as cultures are fluid and references are fluid, um, that we want to make sure we're staying up to date on these things. And your question as to what is the best resource uh, speaks to a real need of not only how we keep up with it on staff, but how do we project that out for the folks who are uh, staffing tables as ambassadors and for volunteers, uh, for our student aides, our recreation leaders and things like that. So this is a great opportunity. It sounds like a great training opportunity for us to either put together some kind of a resource, even just a little cheat sheet on what's happening right now, as far as referencing goes, um, or to try to find those resources for you. So we will definitely work on that and get back to you if you'd like. Yeah, well, I, I agree that we need those pamphlets published again because yes. they, uh, they are immensely popular and they cost a lot of money to publish. I understand that it's very high quality publication as, as brochures go. They, they really are. And that um, when Mayron mentioned that it was an award winner, you know, we had the original publication that was done by uh, Bev Ortiz early on. And the one that was submitted for the award for NAI was indeed an updated version of that. So even from the original publication to the updated publication that won the award, um, there were significant changes on that. And so the next phase comes up when we determine it's time to put a new one together. We certainly will. But yeah, printing them and having them available, is, it's an invaluable resource. There's no doubt about it. So we want to make sure we have plenty of those around. I'm going to make, I'm going to make sure the next, when we get around to doing ambassador training again, uh, which we haven't done for the last couple of years for obvious reasons, I'm, I'm going to make sure I bring those and incorporate them into our overall training because it is a very, and, and, and rightfully so, it's a very popular subject uh, to uh, bring to folks' attentions when they approach our table uh, at the various events that we do take. Uh, last thing, is, 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 the, is someone within our um, scheme, uh, either operationally or in interpretation or planning, uh, are, are we coordinating all of this in order to have an improved interpretation of our indigenous people's history in association with the entire park system. You know, we all are very much aware and have been for quite a while what you do at Coyote Hills. Um, there is, um, I know Kevin Damstra and the Black Diamond naturalists, uh, and, and as well as the Big Break naturalists, as Mike knows, that, that I follow 
<laughs> in my ward, they fairly routinely incorporate Native American history in, in, um, in programs involving those parts. Um, but I'm not aware what we do in any coordinated fashion uh, among the whole park system to enhance our, uh, our, our interpretation. It, it's something I understand the organization, um, <laughs> the park district is, is um, committed to, uh, but I'm not sure how it's being lived out, so to speak, in terms of our bureaucracy. I speak to that real quick. Um, I, I can't speak to the entire bureaucracy of the entire district, but part of our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings over the last six years in Interp and Rec that have also been rolled out to other uh, parts of the district um, include those very things. So this, the presentation that you just saw from Chris and Mayron is an abbreviated and updated version of what they presented to all the INR staff members back at our DEI summit in November. So these messages of, of the underlying theme of untold stories is going out to all the different visitor centers, all the different work groups in INR, and we're charged with presenting those things. So we've gone through all this training, how are we putting this on the ground? Not just Chris and Mayer on, but their charge is to put out what they do to all the other groups so they can also do that. Um, Melissa Folks has taken a lot of that information over to uh, Tilden Regional Park as she's just, uh, she was moving from Big Break over there. So it is moving around the district. Different areas have uh, different histories and different relationships with indigenous groups and indigenous history and cultures as of now. So it's kind of a middle of the movie thing but we're definitely moving in the direction that you were just talking about of, of a grander, coordinated, cooperative effort to put these things forward and tell the untold stories. It's just part of our everyday program. And I referenced the um, entire bureaucracy because I've just been, been in touch with folks who have been involved in it from various aspects, be it operational or planning. Brian Holt spent the better part of a year uh, on the naming project for Thurgood Marshall. And as we all know, we had this sensitive issue about uh, the, the proposed Chukan territory name for that part. And in that process, and Bev, Bev and I met with uh, our planning folks because that was their, their role, right? So Brian um, worked a lot with the, the tribes. And apparently our planners are in regular contact with various representatives of the tribes uh, in connection with our acquisitions, with uh, you know, any, any uh, land use plans they're working on. Uh, they routinely do that. And I've learned from Brian from the park naming uh, experience that the, the, the tribes that he worked with would frequently reference him to what they really wanted to see East Bay Parks embody. And the interesting thing was name, you know, just naming another park after a tribe wasn't high up on their list, it, 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 you know, but, but interpretation was um, specific land uses of Native American land uses within our parks was high on their list. And I'm just wondering then, that brings me to the question, is, is you know, we have a trail czar. I call Sean Dugan our trail czar. You know, everything involving trails ultimately gets to him from, from within the whole system. And I'm wondering if we have a Native American interpretation czar or somebody so that everything Brian learned would go into this one, one realm. Everything interpretation of what you're describing, Mike, goes into somebody's orbit, somebody's information. I, I just think that should be uh, someone's role in, in park systems. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, um, just, just quick, I'm so sorry, go ahead, Christina. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you, Colin, um, uh, Christina Kelchner, AGM of ASD. And um, we are working on that is what I would say. Um, we're really trying to build the um, agencies, the district's uh, cultural resources programs. And that is a combined effort between um, the INR folks, the naturalists and, um, and the planning team. So um, as you know, Anna Marie uh, Guerrero has been doing a lot of work and 
We're working closely with um, the INR folks to build that program. Um, but I would say it's not fully shaped yet. So um, it's something that we're working on. Um, your comments are exactly right on that. Um, what we've heard from uh, the tribes that we've met with so far, and we have more work to do, more listening to do on that, is that it's about telling, it's not just about putting a name on a park, but it's about the interpretation, about telling their stories and about giving them opportunities to engage with the land, um, to do uh, some of their traditional practices, um, and uh, finding more opportunities to do that. So um, we are also working with Together Bay Area, which is the regional coalition of um, uh, park and land management agencies. I'm talking with MidPen and others to learn about their experience um, and trying to do a, a, a regional approach uh, to how we can best work with and represent um, uh, the tribes. So that's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we're working on it and um, point well taken that it'd be great to have somebody in INR who's, who is the point person um, on that. And, I, and I, I think that's in the works, yeah. I would have guessed Anna Marie because certainly Bev Ortiz played that role. The only thing was with Bev, I think it was pretty informal. I don't think the organization actually you know, had a system-wide uh, responsibility in anyone's hands. Bev just took it on her own. That was her, her, her interest. And her role then was kind of informal uh, as the overseer. Uh, but we, we just need to do a lot more than we've done in the past. I think everyone is working on that, as you suggest, Christina. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was left over as something very important for me. And I know um, Be Bev understands this after uh, the experience we went through in that park naming. And uh, so it's always, since that time, it's been high on my list. Yeah, thank you. So Ellen, you had a comment uh, also? Yes, thank you. Um, this is along the same lines of what Director Coffey was talking about, but I think it would be wonderful if we could work with partners and put together some, even write a book, do some text and have the information available so we can save and protect this, this history and the culture. And it would be so important because what happened in our park areas is part of the history for the entire area. And if we want people teaching about it in our local colleges or community colleges, et cetera, you know, we wanna make sure that they have that, that history, right? So if there's some way we can get together as a group and put together some written a written book even that could be used as, as you know, teaching educational text at some point or historical text. I think that would be a wonderful uh, thing to think of doing. So hopefully we will think of that. Is that a possibility? There's brochures, but actually having a book, a text. I'll, I'll let Mike answer that as well if you want to weigh in, but I would just say that I think there is a lot of enthusiasm um, on, by staff to do that work. And I see heads nodding here in the ANR, INR staff, um, their interpretive staff, uh, and certainly in the, in the planning department as well, a lot, of, a lot of support enthusiasm for that. It's a question of staff capacity and staff resources. So um, we just would need to figure out how to, how to fund and staff that, um, but certainly something that staff would love to do. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, certainly, you? thanks, Christina. Um, Director Corbett, that uh, is a great idea. And we've actually been using the Ohlone curriculum as that resource for years, and it's proven invaluable. And then the, um, the brochure and the map that Director Coffey was referring to is the next step in that. Um, whereas when uh, uh, Ben Ortiz was here, she, was, she had that knowledge, and even with her uh, Norm Kidder. So those are folks that had so much knowledge that were incredible resources. And there's always that trick to balance. Do we want to have that one person be the, the, the keeper of that knowledge, that distributor? Because once they leave, even though Bev's been really good and Norm also about sharing their knowledge, we then get into a cult of personality. And we want to make sure that it's, a, it's an institutional knowledge so that right now we're using these, these resources and trying to distribute them so that we have a layer of expertise that's housed at Coyote Hills and then that's distributed out. So folks do have that resource, but because the histories, the tribes are very different 
within our very diverse East Bay area. It's difficult to have a one place for all, but to your point, a resource that, that points that out and gives people some different places to go for local information is a great idea. Thank you. I very much support all of your work on that. I, I like seeing those smiles about this too. <laughs> so thank you. Never Ortiz, by the way, in the curriculum does, which, you know, I, I read that it's, it's designed for me, let alone third graders. <laughs> I, uh, it, it's very well done. I, um, I, uh, I recall she has uh, additional resources, much like the Coyote Hills website PDF that you referred to earlier. She has references to people, tribal historians who, who have written books. Um, I think what you find though, is when you look for, for uh, books these days, they're, 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 they're not modern. They don't have the, all that modern overlay that I, I spoke of earlier. That's very confusing to me. Um, they're, those, those books are you know, decades old uh, that, that are cited. And I don't know if anybody is working on a, on a modern history of the Ohlone. You know, that would be a, a great topic. Or the, or the Miwok. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, I, I do have um, an, some questions and, and comments as well, but I, I, would, I am really pleased that you, what you were uh, focusing on is listening, uh, listening to the different voices. And, um, and I think there are definitely diverse opinions which make it um, a real challenge for you as um, teachers to convey, you know, what is the, the truth about the history of, of our first people. And, you know, what I would, I, I, I'll just say a couple of things. One, I am very glad that we have moved to compensation um, uh, for our descendants, because that's always been a bone of contention that that we'd expect them to to volunteer, and um, many of them certainly um, brought uh, information perspectives that that were worth compensation. So I'm very glad to see that that's happening, and um, I. Uh, you know what? I, what I would love to see see us do as we communicate with other open space um, agencies is develop some best practices for our communications with with um, native descendants. And I at the Together uh, Bay Area uh, meeting that they had at Craneway, I had a chance to talk to Andrea McKinsey, and she was like, "Well, so." You know, so what should our guidelines be here? And different agencies are doing all kinds of things. And to be able to have something that was consistent in terms of, um, well, communication and, and what is appropriate in uh, having park agencies provide whatever, um, I think would be a, a great help. And um, I do feel um, really strongly that it's important for us to pursue providing um, acreage in our 125,000 acres um, for the opportunity for people to have special ceremonies. I mean, I'm not, there's certainly some that say, well, we ought to, for instance, <clears throat> they didn't want us, a certain group didn't want us to open Brushy Peak at all. And uh, some want the property because it used to be their property. But I'm not talking in those terms. I'm just talking and being open to allowing um, ceremonial experiences uh, to happen within, within our parklands. And I I assume that people are having those conversations um, about that as, as a possibility. And I assume also that INR and, and Anna Marie are 
communicating uh, on these issues. I agree, you know, the Ohlone curriculum, I think I look at as, um, as an in-depth resource. Um, and I know she worked to have segments which were set up in theory for third graders, but I think her sophistication, uh, it was hard for her with the sophistication and knowledge that she had um, to, to provide that. Um, so uh, anyway, that, that's all I'll say about that. So when you are talking about um, Bay Area Indians, are you going, um, are you really looking at the whole Bay Area or are you primarily looking at, at the East Bay down to Monterey where, you know, there's a Loney um, in quite a large area? In our educational programs at Coyote Hills Regional Park, uh, the indigenous groups that we're focusing on are the local groups there. So um, we, we talk about the Tui Boon because there's a Tui Boon village site there. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about Himren, which is another tribe that's nearby there. We talk about the Muekma, um, Confederated Villages of the Lashon. So we try to try to talk, discuss the groups that are most local to us because um, our programs are, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So we don't have quite of a capacity to get around to every group in the Bay Area. Um, so those are kind of, we try to focus on local indigenous groups and not discounting any of the other groups in the Bay Area, um, but definitely um, highlighting those groups. Yeah, I mean, they, and they are complex and diverse. And I mean, there, there are a lot of things that are a material culture that are very similar, of course, but they're, they're quite different in some areas. And um, I have to say that I am an enormous fan of your working on the vocabulary in a different way. Um, you know, for me, for people to, uh, to call Indian homes huts, for example, which you had on the list there, I mean, it, it's like, it is really an insult. And people use vocabulary with regard to indigenous people that, that is so casual and so insulting. It's just really hard to relate. Um, and, um, of course I wish you luck and how you're going to use the word Indian or not. Um, and what, so I've been involved in a, in a program since 1990, which had, um, Randy Milliken was one of the people that finally showed some information that was not from the 19th century and uh, Beverly Ortiz helped with it and, and several other people. And, and so we've been doing it, doing this program for fourth graders at our museum. And it, it has generally been a program that, that uh, teachers would come to when they could not get into a regional park program. <laughs> and so we've often had um, naturalists come and assist in the training. Um, so I've watched the, the evolution with a, with a lot of interest. And now I don't do the program anymore, and, um, but I, I help with it. And uh, I see how hard it is to help people move into a new way of talking about the, the, the first, first people. It, it's just, an, it's a real uphill battle. Um, one of the things that I am, I was really pleased that the Park District did was in their ANZA expedition signage, making sure to say where those signs are and, and what the homelands were, you know, at the bottom of each of those signs. And I thought that was such a um, really important first step for us. And I would certainly like to see us do that in our signage in general, because um, these people were here for so long and for us just to skip ahead to something, um, I think is something we should not be involved in. And I love your un untold stories as well. So um, very, very pleased that, that you're looking at things in a new way and um, you know, as um, 
Kevin knows, as I read the um, Thurgood Marshall brochure, that is our initial brochure, I feel really strongly that the Park District um, be very careful about this, the new way people are talking about our indigenous people and, and minorities in general. Because I think with Black Lives Matter, there has been, there are people are going beyond what they should be doing. Um, and the, uh, the attacks on the missions and the neglect of what the miners and Americans did um, strikes me as, as um, no conversations and campaigns that that lack depth. And I would I would want to be sure that in the park district we take a look um, at things in a way that are are not similar to some of the things that are happening in society. And I know things go back and forth. You know, the pendulum does go back and forth. Um, and perhaps I just put my history hat on and want people to see that more than, than others. But to me, it's very important. For instance, with the Thurgood Marshall brochure, I felt that if we're talking resilience as a major concept for our visitor center there, and we're going to talk about the indigenous people, then we need to talk about their resilience for hundreds and thousands of years, not their resilience with the Spanish, which was less than a hundred years. And um, so I want, us, I want us to keep our eye on the, the expanse of what, it, what happens, not what is currently popular to say. Well, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Dr. Lane, may I? Um... Poor Kevin, to that? you know, I, I call him up and say, so did you mean that? Yeah. Uh, Kevin Damster's done a, a lot of work on this and it's, it's just been fantastic. Just a couple of things that came up um, when you were mentioning about developing best management practices for uh, cultural awareness and approaches. Um, one of the ways that we've been doing that is not just through this work, but I just want to call out Chris for being published, not seeing it that well, but in the May-June issue of Legacy, which is the National Association for Interpretations magazine, wrote an article about this very thing. So we're reaching out not just to the East Bay area, but also throughout the profession. And it's been a great opportunity for us to share those management practices. And as far as the different groups, we've been talking a lot about Ohlone's. We also have uh, Miwok peoples, uh, Plains Miwok, Delta Miwok, um, Bay Miwok, the Delta Yokuts people, um, the Northern Valley of Coast people, these are all folks that have, that look to the East Bay Regional Park District land as ancestral homelands and ceremonial sites and important sites. So not just the folks that live here, but the folks who are connected to it. Mm -hmm. And this whole new way of looking at um, indigenous peoples and their cultures and incorporating those, listening to those untold voices, give us a much better opportunity to interpret this, not just to educate folks, but also to inform our land practices and um, how we actually set up, build and operate parks. So the potential is really great and we're just beginning to scratch the surface. And I think that Anna Marie Guerrero has been invaluable in this and in incorporating all these things into, into broader management practices. So um, as uh, Christina Kelsner said just a little while ago, we're getting there. We're in process, constantly moving toward it. Um, and I think we're making really good progress, but there's always more to do. Well, that, that's definitely true. And I, I feel that it's, um, it's been a real um, mistake on the part of the regional parks to think that just one person can, um, can be the cultural resources manager. Um, you know, I, we definitely need more staff focusing on this and supporting um, our operations uh, staff and our our INR, and you just really cannot ask one person to do everything, which is what we did with Bev Ortiz and what I feel we are doing with Anna Maria now. Um, clearly, we need more staff in this area 
if we're going to um, be a, a success in our in an example of best practices. So I'm just tossing that out. It, it is June and it, we're talking budget and everybody's going to compete for staff again and we're going to be um, asking one person to be a superwoman. So, um, all right. So are there any other comments on this um, item? Uh, Colin or Ellen, do you have anything else you'd, you would like to add after my little diatribe for more staff? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you again very much. I, I appreciate it, I, and I really appreciate uh, your work and communicating uh, what you're what you're working to achieve. Um, I, I'm really proud of you. So, thank you thanks. so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Director Lane, I just want to confirm we didn't have any public comment on that item. Hmm. I saw Tammy pop on. Yeah, just to say we did not receive any. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that. All right. So we have a second item uh, on our agenda today, and um, that is our annual review of implementing our updated free roaming cat management policies. And um, so what Matt Growl, I think you are going to lead off with that. Can I, can I make a little statement? Thank you very much, um, Director Lane. I'm very sorry. I, I have to leave the meeting, but I just uh, want Matt to know and the others, I will definitely make sure that um, I am brought up to date on this report. And I also just want to thank you for the work that is being done and the success that has been coming along. I'm sorry I'm going to miss this <laughs> at the moment, but I will definitely spend some, time, some time to uh, catch up on this. And of course, I can review this and, uh, and and meet with a few folks. So I'm very sorry I have to go, but uh, thank, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want people to think I'm not gonna be paying attention to this issue. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, Ellen. Yeah, thanks, Director Corbett. Yeah, well, we can share the slides and, and with the magic of YouTube, you know, you can always go back and watch this now. So that's uh, right. But, but be happy to talk to you more. Um, thank so you. yeah, thanks um, also Director Lane and, and Director Coffey for uh, the opportunity to make this presentation today. So again, Matt Grawl, I'm the Chief of Stewardship um, for the East Bay Regional Park District. And let me just pull up my presentation. A minor issue, it's giving me the wrong option, but I'll just try to do it this way, it should work. Okay. Okay, we're getting closer. Okay. All right, well, so this presentation is an update on the district's free roaming cat management policy um, that we updated about a year ago on June 15th, uh, 2021. Um, the park district is working really on all aspects of the updated policy. And today I'm gonna to be reporting on the progress that's been made. Um, and you'll hear a lot about these other groups, but I just wanted to initially start off that this has really been a great a team effort. Uh, really led by stewardship and, and operations staff. We've got a core team of managers and staff that have been actively working to implement this, but none of this would have been possible without the um, collaboration and support of our uh, interpretive staff. Our public affairs staff has also been very involved in developing um, improved signage and messaging. Um, and then HR and our training staff um, has been really helpful in, in establishing some training programs. So I'll, I'll talk about those aspects in more detail uh, during the presentation, but just wanted to really acknowledge um, those staff and their, their contributions um, throughout this process. Um, and we'll talk about it more during the presentation. So, um, but before we start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why this works important and then protecting species at risk of extinction. And, um, and just to remind you that, you know, we're, we are in a global diversity hotspot here in the San Francisco Bay area. And we're also fortunate to live in a place where there's a 
enough habitat that has been preserved that we still have rich biodiversity. Uh, but the biodiversity is under severe and constant threat from human encroachment. And only about 5% of our wetland and sh uh, shoreline habitats uh, remain. Um, and so it's uh, many of these species are, are constantly under threat from urban encroachment. Um, but at the Park District, we have an opportunity and an obligation to protect these unique species that are native to our East Bay lands. These animals belong here and they were here uh, before people were. And they really provide a, a richness and um, exciting uh, opportunity to view wildlife um, in the Bay Area. And as many of our sites are nationally renowned uh, for, by bird watchers and others that come um, to these sites to, to view uh, the unique species they can uh, observe in, on our lands. Um, so as we're learning more all the time, biodiversity and health functioning ec ecosystems are essential to clean water, clean air, and to the health of, of our Earth, and, uh, but also to human species as well. Um, so that's why one of our core missions is to preserve the rich culture, heritage of natural resources on our lands. Uh, but additionally, you know, this work is really re also required by, um, by regulatory permits. So many of the lands we operate, um, and specifically at Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline, were um, g given to us as mitigation lands. And so uh, the MLK Shoreline specifically was um, established many of the marshes there or the new marshes specifically was established as mitigation for Oakland Airport expansion and after uh, they met their requirements you know the district agreed to take on these lands and to manage them in perpetuity um, and so with that um, we management perpetuity always comes with also comes with the responsibility to uh, protect the endangered species that are living in on these lands um, and so we and we but this also comes with, like I said, the legal obligations to comply with the regulatory permits and, and make sure we don't create a, a sink situation. And the, if we you know if we didn't um, protect these uh, these ha habitats from predators, we could be encouraging you know the endangered species to live there, to, to attempt to breed, and and then the sink happens when they they don't successfully reproduce. So basically, you could be um, in putting the population in peril if we don't um, allow successful uh, reproduction in, in these marshes. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging uh, uh, operation and management uh, situation, but we really takes constant um, effort and attention to really protect our public investment and protect these sensitive habitats. Um, this slide really shows some of the species that we're talking about primarily, uh, the endangered species that are um, on, at risk of extinction and, and also exist on our properties. Um, the, the impact of urban development on wildlife is, is well documented worldwide and it's a worldwide issue. It causes you know, habitat loss and fragmentation and disruption and imbalances in the natural ecosystem. So some species thrive on human presence and become overabundant with the easily available food and shelter. Uh, think primarily raccoons and California gulls are two species that have really um, expanded uh, with urban development, um, but at the same time, other species are dwindled nearly to the point of extinction. And, and in order to save these species, we need to have some human intervention to balance um, the urban uh, impacts and, and to protect these habitats. So uh, the burrowing owl and the, and the salt marsh harvest mouse are two that really come to mind um, that are really threatened um, often by the human encroachment and really need that intervention to be saved. Um, and also the snowy plover in the least term for that matter, really all these species need some level of protection and human in intervention to thrive. Um, and I guess the other thing I said earlier, but the 5% of the shoreline habitat that remains, it's these isolated habitat islands. They really provide this refuge for these species, but um, it's very challenging to maintain and protect those areas just because of their unique location along the bay. Um, let me see next slide. Sorry about that. I had a slight delay in advancing the slide. So um, the, the revised free roaming cat policy um, was really established in 2020 after there's significant public concern uh, about our um, previous policy. And we realized we needed to update it um, to make it um, function better and to have more clear communication on uh, how uh, we were implementing our, our protection policies. So the park district initially issued a moratorium on any lethal actions and then uh, started a comprehensive review of the policy. And that uh, had significant input from the community and uh, local animal services agencies. Uh, the park district then, uh, um, then updated our policy with 
the following kind of key points. So the main thing is we wanted to avoid lethal control uh, through increased uh, prevention and trapping. So the prevention is really preventing the predators from getting into these sensitive habitat areas. And then, uh, and then if we do see predators in those predators in those areas doing an extensive uh, trapping effort to try to remove um, the, the subject, um, primarily cats in the situation. Um, so the one thing about the policy, it prohibits lethal control except as a last resort. And that, that last resort would be after collaboration with the animals at shelters um, to coordinate trapping and rehoming of um, free roaming cats. Um, the policy also requires um, compliance with the Association for Veterinary Management uh, compliance with those standards for um, protection of health, um, and also allows animal shelters to inspect and confirm um, if we had to do a lethal removal to make sure uh, it was done in a humane way. Um, and also our policy follows best practices that were established by wildlife agencies nationwide. Okay, so here's the timeline. Um, I, I did talk about it a little bit in the last slide, but the, the moratorium was on December 10th. Um, of 2020, and we issued the moratorium, and, and we're actively meeting with a lot of our partners in the time, trying to determine uh, how we could um, better um, source and staff uh, the um, protection of, of these species, and also make sure we could um, keep the free roaming cats out of our marshes. Um, and then we we presented um, where we were headed, and are at the December, I mean, I was at the February 25th Natural Re Cultural Resources Committee meeting. And then we brought the full um, policy to the board for adoption on um, June 15th. Uh, so after the board adopted uh, the updated policy, we then also gave another uh, brief update at the end of um, 2020 uh, to our, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of 2021, sorry, um, to the Natural Cultural Resources Committee. And then um, in 2022, uh, we did to give the board an update um, as we were, um, uh, approving a contact for USDA, um, and USDA helps us with predator management at the Hayward shoreline and traps cats within the sensitive portion of the marshes that um, staff that well only some staff can work in, but the animal services agencies don't have the permits to work in these marsh habitats. So that's where we need USDA to help us do trapping in very sensitive habitats. And so um, we approved that contract on February 15th, and during that presentation gave a detailed update on where we were on this policy. Um, and now today we're giving the full sort of annual report. Um, and I guess I could also mention that we did give the board an update uh, to the board members that attended the board field trip last week. Um, um, we did uh, get to update uh, a little bit on how implementation was going during that field visit. So um, the annual report today, I mean, I'm gonna talk about is really gonna talk about the capture and removal methods that have been used. Um, our court, give you an update on our coordination with local animal services agencies. Also talk about some infrastructure improvements and more deterrence that we've been implementing. Talk about our education and prevention uh, programs. And also um, some new met methods we're using for tracking and locating colonies and removal. Um, also some enforcement that we've, we've had to do over the last year. And, and also talk about some more of the transparency moving in the future and, and our reporting, uh, ongoing reporting. So capture and removal methods, um, we, we are doing active you know, coordination with animal services agencies. So it really depends on their support. Um, and one thing we've been doing though, to, to focus their support and, 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 and to direct them in the right areas when we need their support, um, is we're doing a lot more, uh, using a lot more remote cameras. Um, so the slide you see here and the, um, and the pictures you see on this slide are um, really an example of success. Um, now, Unfortunately, the, the, the top left photo, though, does show um, a, a free roaming cat, um, and it looks like it's eating a buffalo head there. Um, and so that's uh, it was a bit of a surprise, but um, that they would be going after that bird. But at the time, but we did see it on the camera, and that was on um, December 9th, 2021. Well, um, on January 6th, that same cat was trapped um, by a volunteer, and you can see that uh, picture of the cat in the trap there. Um, we did were able to verify by the ear clip that it was the same individual, um, and it was uh, that cat was then rehomed. Um, so the, the it was taken to the animal service agency, and they worked with volunteers to then rehome that this cat. Um, over the last year, we've had 81 free roaming cats trapped and rehomed in the area. This most of these cats have been uh, trapped in the area of the MLK 
regional shoreline, but we've also had numerous cats trapped at the Hayward regional shoreline. Um, so yeah, so, oh, and I guess they just, I, I, Doug sent me a note on the buffalo head being a duck, but I think it was just odd to see, um, it's just, it's just a large bird for a cat to be um, going after. So I think that was the surprise I was expressing. It was just, uh, we were surprised by the large size uh, of the what this cat had decided to, to um, pick up and carry around in the marsh. I should put the quote up. So. Um, Okay, sorry, my. And so, and I guess the other highlight from this slide, but I was about to move to the next one, is to highlight that there has been no lethal control um, over the um, the last year. We've had not had not had a need, and by by these increased trapping efforts, have really um, eliminated some of the pressure in these areas. So we haven't felt the need um, to exercise any lethal control in these sensitive habitats. Um, so there's been ongoing and active coordination with the animal services agencies. Uh, we meet with them on a monthly basis, and uh, we're working to develop a long-term cooperative agreement. Uh, so we've been sharing um, drafts of an agreement and, and having our attorneys take a look at the language we've been drafting, and we're uh, getting closer to having a finalized agreement that then can be approved by the uh, legal counsel from the um, other agencies. Um, and so we're working towards that, and we expect to have that in place uh, later this year. Um, but uh, before we um, Finalize that, um, but we were already working to provide financial support. So we were able to start providing some financial support to the Friends of Oakland Animal Services, um, and they are will be helping to, to bring in additional volunteers. And so the money we're providing to the Friends of Oakland Animal Services will really be used to hire um, more, um, or, or not hire, but to help compensate some of these volunteers. So it's uh, more, it's easier for them to do some of the work to, to trap and rehome uh, these cats. Um, and the foundation has also uh, generously uh, agreed to provide uh, funding for the next um, three years. And so we've identified approximately $25,000 per year that will be given to the agencies for the next three years from the Regional Parks Foundation. So um, it's gonna be a, certainly a big support and will help us in, in maintaining this long-term partnership by providing this financial support so they can continue their efforts. Okay, uh, and for infrastructure and deterrence, we've done some improvements. So in August of 2021 at the, the New Marsh, um, we had a Student Conservation Association provide over 200 volunteer hours to remove vegetation. So they removed vegetation along uh, the fence line at the New Marsh. And this is in an effort to prevent uh, cats from um, jumping on the, or climbing on the vegetation and the jumping over the uh, fence. Um, Okay, there, I think there may be a problem with my display. Is that better? I got a chat window. I guess I'm gonna have to close it. So let's see. Okay, so- um, I'm seeing it all right. Okay, um, we, we also, we have about 10,000, we got a $10,000 grant. And this year we're gonna be working with Civicor to do some additional vegetation removal along that fence. Um, and so that should also make the fence function better, but it, and also when we remove the vegetation, it helps identify holes and areas for fence repairs. Um, and we're also, uh, we've also upgraded some uh, garbage cans to reduce um, available food sources. Um, you can see an example of one in, on the right, bottom right corner. Um, and we're, we're gonna be do doing more of those in other sensitive locations, but we've been able to, do, a few of them have been able to be installed at the new, near the new marsh at MLK. And we look to expand those. And then this is really these, these bear saver trash cans have really become the, um, the standard for the district when we're putting in any new trash cans. Um, but just we have several areas where we could, could do more replacements of older ones. But it, specifically, at the, it's not as much of a sensitive habitat at the Tyler Ranch staging area. But I was just there the other day and I saw you know, all the new trash cans are these new bear savers that are being installed there. Um, and we've also renewed three contracts to monitor bird and mammals in shoreline parks. So we have um, several groups that are out um, with uh, using cameras to help identify um, and monitor uh, the predator interactions in these parks. So for the education and prevention, we've also uh, improved the signage. And, um, and you can see an example of that uh, in the photo here. Um, this is one of the signs that's out um, at a, a bridge adjacent to the new marsh at MLK Regional Shoreline. 
Um, and that's that's so that shows the improved signage. We've also been working on updated brochures, and this is really we had a lot of help from our interpretive staff to update our brochures um, and stewardship and interpretive. We've been working closely with public affairs to create more to brochures to explain people one the history of cats and, and their um, and how they've. Um, expanded and developed a relationship with humans but then also talking about ways to keep uh, them safe and to have them have the, the best uh, uh lives for themselves because often you know the, the life for a cat an outdoor cat um and especially in these urban environments is is typically typically not a good one um and so the brochure really talks about some of those challenges and then also uh, suggests ways people can um um, protect the health of their cat and also protect sensitive wildlife uh, by keeping them indoors or by using catios or things like that. Um, and we're also working on a lot of internal education. So um, we are working uh, to develop a way and we have developed a full training that will be placed on the summit uh, training platform that the district's been using for the last couple of years. Um, and it will be a full training for all staff um, that work um, in the parks, in the field on, on one, how to, um, so what well, educates on the problems uh, with cats um, in, a, in, a, in a wildlife setting. Also, uh, we'll give some education on what to do if they encounter problems with cat feeding in their parks. And then also how to discuss these issues uh, with the public if someone questions um, some of the work we're doing. And so it gives an explanation of, uh, uh, of just how to interact with the public if there's a concern for free roaming cats in our parks. Um, so and some other methods we've been using for tracking and locating the colonies and for moving, we've, uh, we, do, we did an internal survey um, of operations staff and we had 22 responses from park operations and uh, they helped identify that we had challenges with free roaming cats um, at about 13 locations. Uh, but I will say that the area, um, the primary areas that were identified were areas we were already aware of and the other 13 locations um, that there were there, well, I'm sorry, the additional locations as part of the 13 that we learned about um, didn't have as much intense pressure as the areas we already were working in. So the areas that uh, they see cats occasionally, uh, but it gives us a good idea of how to plan for future efforts and how to start thinking about um, if, if a problem does come up in those areas, um, uh, who we would coordinate to, to address, address those issues. Uh, we data tracking, we have shared spreadsheets that we uh, share with the animal services agencies and our staff that we can then um, put um, add cats that we've seen um, in a certain park to that shared spreadsheet. And then when they um, go out and do trapping efforts, they also add that information to our spreadsheet so we can try to track um, where we're having observations and then where cats are being removed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier that we, we've been really expanding our camera trapping. Um, and so we've got cameras now, um, at the, the, the photo you see in the background is really a photo from the Albany Bowl. It's an amazing photo. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Western Boeing Owl at the um, Albany, actually it says the bull, but it's like technically the Albany Plateau. Um, and, and, and so you can see the owl there. We've been doing monitoring there uh, to make sure those owls are protected. Uh, and then we've also got our cameras at the MLK Regional Shoreline and the Hayward Shoreline. And that was the photos I showed on the previous slide um, from the um, MLK region, Junior Regional Shoreline, the New Marsh. Um, and so we've also got some upcoming research um, and it's, it's being initiated uh, through UC Berkeley and, and the Shell Lab. And they're gonna be looking at um, really the effectiveness of, uh, of exclusion fencing in our shoreline parks. And then also looking at some of the socioeconomic uh, drivers of biodiversity. Um, and so the first study is really looking at the effectiveness of the fencing and comparing wildlife detections within and outside of the fences. So, um, you know, are we seeing them outside? Are they getting in? If we're seeing them inside, also trying to understand kind of how they're getting into these areas and what we can do to improve um, our, our um, perimeter protection of these habitats. And then the second study is gonna look at how social heterogeneity, uh, socioeconomic, demographic, and then attitudes, uh, attitudinal predictors, shape patterns of uh, mammalian biodiversity in our cities. So in doing so, the hope is that the research will both advance the understanding of how social systems influence wildlife community dynamics as well as help promote applied solutions that promote wildlife friendly and equitable cities. So um, very interesting work that will certainly help us inform uh, future management. And, um, and we do have uh, one of the researchers here um, uh, that's gonna speak under public comment about some of the research they're doing. So enforcement, um, we haven't had to do a lot of enforcement this year, but we have had to do some. 
Um, and so, as you know, uh, feeding and abandonment of domestic animals and wildlife is prohibited under Ordinance 38. And so, um, in some cases, we've had to have public safety respond and uh, and remind people, or or and we've had reports uh, in the of people uh, dumping animals at times and had public safety respond, but they haven't necessarily always been able to find uh, the person um, in, in the park at a certain time. But um, but they have both, and so most of the interactions have really happened more at the staff level um, or at the a a animal services agencies and their volunteers because they're the ones that often interact uh, with the public uh, when they're um, attempting to drop off animals. Um, and but we and we've had some unique situations that have happened over the last year of people dropping animals that have been trapped on their private property um, into our parks. So we've certainly had our staff has been active, our operation staff in, in educating the public and making sure they're more aware about um, how to behave in our parks. So uh, as part of our transparency and reporting, that's this why we're providing this annual report today. Um, and we've, as I, said, as I said earlier, we've made progress on all um, policy components and we've captured and removed um, over 81 uh, free roaming cats since the beginning of this collaboration in early 2021. And also just wanna emphasize, we've had no lethal removal um, during this time period. Um, and so the board is set to review the policy at least every five years. And so um, we will plan to have a policy, a detailed policy review in 2026. Uh, but until then, we'll continue with these annual updates um, as per the policy um, each year and updating the board on, on how things are going. So, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, and so I will now stop sharing my screen and we can uh, take any questions. And I do have Tammy and Doug here to support uh, for if there's more specific uh, wildlife questions. Oh, and then Jeff Manley on the operations side is also in, in here in the room. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will say that some of these photos of the cats look just like mine. So there must be a few tabbies out there. Uh, so Colin, do you have some questions or comments? Matt, I found the funding that you folks put together for the, uh, Friends of the Alameda uh, shelter was significant. You know, in the early stages of this, we were talking about maybe $10,000 here or there. Uh, those were the numbers I was hearing. And I think it would benefit Bev and anyone else to know that it's actually quite significant three year funding. Um, and I believe it's coming from the foundation uh, and, uh, and, and, part of our contingency fund from a couple of years ago, um, mine specifically. But could you outline that for Bev and others? Yeah. Well, yeah, and the way you said it's accurate, um, and that's what we're planning for 25,000 per year. Um, and we're working to get the um, agreement set up in the, in the transfer of funds to happen. We, we have to do a few things with um, getting the, them set up as a vendor and then working through the transfers uh, to the districts, uh, the, tra the fund transfer process. And we're working to get that going right now. So we expect that money to be available to them um, in, in soon. And, uh, and it will be for three years. And, uh, and I think also when we're having that amount of base funding is really helpful. And I think we've even talked to service the agencies if, well, if we have a really busy year and, and all of a sudden we need to do more and that's not enough, that makes it a lot easier for the district to su provide supplemental funding. Um, you know, we certainly don't have, and, and, and at least in the stewardship budget, we don't have the, the money right now to provide the full amount. So this foundation funding is excellent to help provide a bridge and then really just determine what the real need is going to be ongoing. Uh, because right now, uh, a lot of the work over the last year, those uh, 81 cats, now they weren't all trapped by animal service agents, but, but, but the majority were, um, have all been done just by volunteers at this point um, and who are just very passionate about this work. So they may have other grant funding or things that support their work, but it, it's really going to be great to have um, a, a source that really directly supports this. So they're not having to tap into other monies they have for other things or just to do it on their own time, uh, because often um, the trapping efforts are very intense and the drop traps they're using when, the, when, when it, they have to be manually operated. Um, and that's why they're often so effective, though, is because they have these large open air traps that the cats get in to get food and they have to sort of pull a string to drop the lid on that trap. But that often involves them being out there for four to six hours at a time um, to actually be successful. And often at, at late in the evening um, and also late at night at sometimes once we're having concentrated efforts. So, um, yeah, it will be very helpful. Yeah, they've loaned one to to me, my son and I 
just set it up outside in order to trap a whole litter um, of, of kittens. Uh, and uh, it is a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in terms of just setting up, learning how to transfer angry cats from that big tomahawk, they call it a tomahawk cage into a smaller cage. And, and anyway, I learned a lot by working with those folks on my own uh, feral cat issue under my house a year or so ago. I'm, I'm yeah. still taking care of essentially five of those cats. Um, anyway, I, I was very pleased to hear of the funding because my concern from the beginning was that the... Uh, Initial, uh, you know, for lack of any other word for it, the, the initial outrage at what happened uh, that was generated uh, among both the general public and, and cat, uh, cat uh, rescue people in particular uh, resulted in all these folks coming out and, and, and as volunteers uh, doing the uh, trapping, neutering, and rehoming. Uh, this, this was a change from trapping, neutering, and returning to a colony because uh, these folks all understood that the problem here with that and what had been happening was you don't return cats to a sensitive habitat where there are maybe a thousand birds left in the, in, on earth that we're trying to steward. So having understood that, the, the process became rehoming. Um, and my concern was, how was that going to be sustained? It was initiated through uh, emotional outrage, uh, and and you know, can it be sustained? And I think what we learned is because these volunteer efforts did um, really take care of the, any need for lethal means of removal, that it was a successful program, and it did need to be sustained, and that. Is where the funding funding comes from. I mean, you can only ask these folks to spend so you know midnight hours out trapping for so long, uh, and they ought to be compensated in, in order to attract more uh, folks to do this work. Right. Uh, and I like it that we're doing a mix of our people doing it, USDA doing it, and and then reliance on the volunteers who actually um, take them to the clinics where they get neutered which is, you know, key. This is how these, these cats will not reproduce. Um, and that's, that, that costs a lot. That, um, I think when I had the, it done with my ferals, it was $105 a cat, um, as I recall. So that adds up. And, uh, you know, we should be encouraging that because these are, this, this, this helps us as well. Uh, so I'm very pleased by the report itself. I, I, I think I, told you and Christina, I was very pleased with the upbeat uh, tone of the whole report that we are truly excited by the success of the program uh, and uh, the ability to sustain this ongoing relationship with the volunteers and, and the uh, shelter folks. Uh, so I think it's, uh, uh, you know, everyone's dedicated to sustaining this success and keeping it going. And that makes uh, we as board members a lot more relaxed that, you know, this, this isn't going to um, uh, result in, in any similar outrages in the future. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to mention that I had at one point been told there was going to be direct funding from the district to maybe $15,000 a year to the um, Contra Costa shelter and Antioch shelter, both of whom was assist uh, in Ward 7. Uh, what, what, I didn't see that number in your report. Is that something that's yeah, not well, it, was the, it was the board contingency funding. I think you're talking about the 7,500. I may, I, I might have glanced over that quickly. Um, but yeah, there's about 7,500 of board contingency funds that will, were, are being transferred to the um, Antioch Shelter, East Contra Costa um, Animal Benefit Fund, and then also Friends of Oakland Animal Services additionally. So well, there was, kind of, there was a pitch to the foundation that there would be an additional 15 a year to the, those two Contra Costa shelters that the foundation didn't want to cover so what I was told, it was the district would probably just do that directly out of district funding rather than foundation. Yeah, I think that proposal, what I've heard that proposal is made to our general manager, but I've not heard um, yet. Um, I mean, what, so that's for me to take up with the general manager, I guess. Well, okay. <laughs> um, I, I know that request was made um, by the foundation. And so I'm not sure where that stands. Um, I know we are getting ready to start our annual budget process for 23. So 
Hey, okay, just uh, point maybe. me in the right direction to go and I won't tell anyone. <laughs> Um, other other I, than those here, right. no, one will, no. <laughs> no one will know. Right. Yeah. Just a, well, on another note, a few things you said made me think of a couple of things. Um, one, just the, the benefit of this partnership with animal service AG, agencies is already providing um, just the, having the closer working relationships. We've we have had a few unique situations, um, and we needed to reach out to them, but maybe need support. One um, was on the um, the ball python that was released um, um, that that we really were. Um, looking at how to work with them potentially and they helped us know where we could rehome that um and and, and also we had a unique situation the peacock we thought we were gonna have to take some intervention um and they were going to be really helpful in, in addressing that um and so um it just the, it can be very helpful in other um sensitive way and we're also talking to each or the contra costa and we'll start group about collaborating more around education around coyotes and uh prevention of uh just human interactions with coyotes and then how to respond if you do in, in, in encounter an aggressive coyote. So uh, these relationships we're doing, implementing this program have just already providing, providing additional uh, dividends. Um, and then also on the training side, I did mention the ongoing training we've developed, but I, I, I think I was having a few technical difficulties looking at all my notes. And I did, I meant to mention that we're their next phase this year, this year we're gonna be developing another, an additional training on trapping. And, and developing another training for staff in our parks that want to do more of the trapping efforts themselves uh, when these situations come up. So we are gonna be doing a more advanced training on, on management on just how to implement trapping um, later this year. I think I've mentioned to you in the past because you just triggered the thought, I've been told on more than one occasion by uh, the ICRA volunteer that I've worked with who's helped me with my issue, my feral cat issue is, is uh, Tiffany Ashbaker. And, She's personally responsible for more than maybe 60 some odd uh, trappings over the last couple of years. Um, but Tiffany has expressed an interest in actually being involved in some of our uh, local staff training programs so that um, our staff get to know how she and other volunteers like to operate and like to work uh, and uh, want our police to, to know them. So that when they're out there after midnight and uh, our police come by, they'll understand that what, what Tiffany and others are doing. Yeah. Uh, so you might, yeah. might want to contact ICRA or those folks for, right. you know, helping with our training. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, we are, we did get a re reference um, from one of the um, shelters to work with Feral Change, um, the organization Feral Change. And so uh, we are planning to work with them, but we'll also sort of, now that we know Tiffany has an interest, we'll certainly, um, reach out to her. I hadn't heard that um, directly. I know she's got a lot. She's been just a great help. So certainly when it would want her to be involved and certainly we, we should make sure those volunteers, the public safety is familiar and, and, and know them. I mean, when we do these more intensive efforts within our parks, uh, we have always notified public safety that it's going to be happening and, and, and often it's in detailed emails, about who's going to be where at what time. Um, and, but sometimes they don't have to come onto our actual land to do it. So, you know, they, they it'd be good, in those cases, for the officers to know them because if they see them on the edge of our parks, know what's happening. Hmm. I'm sorry, I just had to kill a, a phone call. <laughs> um, last question, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the pamphlet uh, on cat. We have one on dogs and now we'll have one on cats. That'll be very handy for the tabling that we do. I mean, as someone is not getting the hint um, that I'm not taking their call. Um, what is a cat catio? You said it described a. a yeah, it's just a. Um, it's it's a way to create an outdoor space attached to an indoor structure. That uh, it's so it's a little cat patio or maybe a cat. It's like a small porch for a cat. So not like a screened-in porch for a human, but it's like a a a, 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 a so it would attach to a home. Um, and it's an open sort of window that a cat can sit in and feel like it's outside. The idea is if you're, if you take it upon yourself to feed ferals, you would want to use that type of area to protect them from coyotes or something like that. Well, it'd be more for your cats in your home, you know, cats that are I mean, oh. pets and the idea to give them, a, you know, a more of an experience of being outside, but, but they're still in an enclosed space. So they're not out. Okay. Birds. All right. I'll get the brochure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't think, I don't know the way we did a little picture. I think we just refer to resources for, for other things like that and, and way to do uh, other options to consider.
it's been interesting talking with Colin over the past period, you know, when we were discussing feral cats and, and free roaming cats and for him to actually have it happen at his house is, you know, it's one thing to have your, my cat wandering around, but it's another to have feral cats born under your porch. So uh, anyway, um, be that as it may, I really appreciate the report today. Um, 81 cats seems like quite a few, but maybe it is not. What would you say? I don't know yet, um, you know, because I, I, I know there's a lot in the surrounding area, and I think it'll be interesting to see how it happens over, over the years. I mean, I think in the past, we're only trapping or or, or, or removing the, the most the, the most lethal, the ones that are really lethally impacting birds. We weren't really addressing the problem, and now we're really getting to the root of the problem more. Um, and so it's hard to under, know if it was there were a few feeding stations adjacent to the park were really driving these numbers, or if, or, or I mean, so I think there's going to be some of that socioeconomic understanding of what, what's happening and what the interests, what are the drivers here? Are there businesses establishing new feeding stations? Are there what, you know, what's driving that, um, the pressure for those cats adjacent to these areas. And we're going to learn a lot more about that. Uh, and the animal service agencies in those situations where we've had uh, private businesses or people around the parks, where we notice they're becoming a source. They have been going and talking to those people and talking to different businesses and explaining the problems of why they shouldn't be feeding cats on their property. And, um, and we'll see how, how um, effective that all can be over the next few years. Um, okay. so I think we'll have to see a few years of data to understand, is this just because we hadn't been addressing it, also made 81, or is this this ongoing issue in the community that we need to do more educational efforts and more interaction to, to reduce? So we'll have to see. Yeah, I'm, and I expect it to go down, but I just, you know, it's hard to say until we actually do the work. So sorry. There's so many people who have, who have uh, done this and released them and then fed them. I mean, they feel like that's the right thing that they should be doing. And they need to understand that indeed, it doesn't do those cats any any uh, service, given the wild animals that are out there that are very happy to help themselves to cats. So there's, there's anyway, I think we've we've um, proceeded to try and resolve this with as much um, grace and information as we can manage and I, I appreciate having in the report come to the natural and cultural resources, Matt, very much. Uh, so we have some people who would who want to talk to us further about this. Yeah, one and we have one person present for public comment. Tyus, you want to turn on your camera and unmute? Okay, guys. Uh, I need access to turn on my camera. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I guess just just a brief input. I'm just for public comment. I'm, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm in Chris Shell's um, lab. He's the new faculty member, new tenure track faculty at UC Berkeley. Um, my background is in carnivore ecology and spatial ecology. So I ask the larger questions of you know, who, what, where, what, who, what, where, how, and why, you know, large predators and otherwise other carnivorous species are moving throughout landscapes in the stimuli for what's influencing them in their behavioral patterns. Um, and uh, Tammy, as well as she knows me um, throughout this project, um, I've taken a great curiosity in the questioning of just how not only feral cats, but other um, mesopredators and a mesopredator is just like a mid-sized predator. So like a skunk or a raccoon um, or a fox would be considered in this group, um, how they're utilizing these shorelines to their advantage. Um, and if the exclusion fencing that has been developed in some of these areas has any actual significant forms of um, deterrence. Um, so actually looking at the efficacy for those things. Um, so I just want to first off just want to say thanks to everybody for the resources. Um, and out of the shoreline so out of the shoreline sites that we've been surveying, um, we've been getting some really cool um, uh, observations. Um, and hoping to have some more information collected and developed further on um, for, I believe, the um, review that you guys will be having in uh, November. So hopefully having something to actually present and share with you guys in the future. I'm not sure if anybody has any actual specific questions about the work that I'm doing. 
um, because I can expand on those particularities if needed. Uh, but in terms of just the research that's been done, um, Matt actually really covered a lot of that really well. Um, so um, uh, in terms of specific, 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 um, specific specifications of what I'm doing. Um, yeah, if anybody has questions, I'm here um, in terms of like the work that I'm doing um, and hoping to um, uncover um, in the future. So. Uh, Tyus, I'm very interested in what you're doing and uh, both, both in, in, in terms of uh, how to control predators and, and uh, the whole scope of, of uh, predation going on that we're experiencing. And uh, I wonder if it was possible that you could just uh, get me your email so I can chat with you sometime. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm not sure what the best way to share that is. I, I think the chat's only closed for like groups of people, but um, if anybody wants to contact me. Here, um, here it is. I'm um, ccoffee at ebparts.org, ebparts.org. Okay. So you you email me at ccoffee Got it. at ebparts.org, and uh, then I'll have your, uh, your email and I can get in touch with you. Yes, sir. I just wrote it down. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here for questions. And thanks for once again having me um, in this this conversation. It's been really awesome watching you guys uh, share all your um, findings and um, updates. So do you have some preliminary information about the, the yeah. fencing that we have that's affecting yeah, so I, I can definitely go into some of it. So it's it's interesting. Um, and just just a brief kind of um just a brief kind of brief over, overview. Yeah. yeah, sure. Certainly, certainly a brief overview. Um so um there's 11 regional shorelines um in the East Bay that the East Bay Regional Parks Districts cover. Um my interest started with the in Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline, which is where my project started. Um and obviously as a PhD student, we have to develop chapters. So I was like, well, I need more data. So I was like, why don't I just cover all of the shorelines? So I decided I'm going to look at all the shorelines for, for you guys. Um, and so far out of the seven that I have put cameras at so far, um, I have found differentiating populations of feral cats um, in all of them out of the 11 that I'm hoping to cover, which is very interesting because obviously these are these have to be individually unique species, not, in, not individually unique species, but these have to be individually unique cats that differ from each of the sites. Um, and my interest was actually looking at how the shoreline fencing actually influences detection of these animals, which is why we're using the cameras. But actually a lot of these shorelines don't have actual connected fence lines that actually keep animals out of some of these areas. So I'm actually actually adjusting a lot of my questions to look at how these animals are actually utilizing uh, these shorelines as corridors. And if they're utilizing these habitats to their advantage because of their proximity to um, residential areas, because some of these animals are also um, generalist and highly adaptive as well, like raccoons um, is a great example, and coyotes, as we're well familiar with, especially in some parts of the Bay Area. Um, and so I guess one of the main things I would say that's probably the most interesting preliminary form of data is that in just about every site that I've surveyed, all the way from Hayward to let's say as north as Point Pinole, um, we have been getting um, photos of feral cats. And it's just really interesting questions like, where are they coming from? How far are they traversing to get into these areas? And um, how are they utilizing them to their advantage? So, and that's like really an interesting question so that I've been thinking about a lot right now. Okay, thank you very much. I, yeah, um, that's great. I think it has to be helpful to staff. Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope I hope it's helpful for everything I figure out so far. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So, do we have someone else who wanted to speak to us on this item? No. There are no other public comments. Okay. okay then we will move from this agenda item. And thank you, Matt, again. All all the work yeah. on this well, and report. You know, there's a lot of, like I said, a big team effort. So I, I appreciate the thank you, but I'll accept the thank you for the entire team. So, okay. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, getting a copy of the management policy and information that, that was included there. Okay. So um, then we come to board comments. And do you have any comments, Colin? No, I don't. 
Okay. I would like at some point to renew our uh, list of uh, potential topics to see where we are with that list. Okay. You and I both had topics that we put forth. And frankly, at this point, I don't remember what I think perhaps I have a copy of some email, but uh, I, I think someone should have an ongoing list. I'm pretty sure somebody does. So, um, yeah, Christina and definitely does. And, and, and we, we do. I just I don't have it at my fingertips to pull it up right now, but I know we have a plan and, and I think we're sticking pretty closely to it. I think one of the items might have fallen off, but um, but I, 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 I don't recall what the next items are for the next agenda though. Okay, well, I'm, I am certainly appreciating the fact that, that we're having some very interesting um, cultural resources reports. So um, in addition to our nationals, so I appreciate that. Okay, so if we have no other comments, uh, Matt, do, um, do you have anything or Christina? that you want to share before we adjourn? I don't have anything, I can't think of anything right now. I know Christina did have to leave to go to another site visit, um, an important meeting, but I, so, but thank you. I, I guess we'll make sure to, I mean, I will talk to Christina and Sabrina, about make sure to get you the, the, the proposed agenda for the rest of the year, just to, to review that and, and put that, you know, the, the top of your inbox again. Okay, that would be very helpful. Yeah, and, again, and the other thing I was going to say is too, I guess earlier after Ty is finished, you know, as, the, as these studies, you know, get more um, closer to having more conclusions or, or, or more um, completion, uh, where there's interesting things or interesting results to present, uh, we will either bring those back to the committee or bring those to the stewardship seminar, but we will be highlighting some of the, you know, the findings from the, and how we integrate it. And it may be a component of a future annual update, but likely there'll be standalone presentations talking about some of this active research. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara and all who are watching us today. And you have a nice rest of the day. We are adjourned. Thanks for all the work folks. <laughs>